Welcome to a very special edition of the pod, you curiouser and curiouser Hurley Burleyites. If you're a longtime listener, you might remember way back in 2020, just about a month before the world shut down, we held our own Hurley Burley version of an Ontario Liberal leadership debate, which basically means we took most of the overwrought rules of national network debate and chucked them out. Well, we're doing it again 43 months later. Last time we had five of the six leadership candidates in the studio, Del Duca declined our invitation. This time around, I'm chuffed to say we have the whole goddamn enchilada. All four candidates are here in the studio, Yasser Nakvi, Ted Sue, Bonnie Crombie, and Nate Erskine-Smith. There are no podiums, no prepared statements, and no official clock. This is going to be an equitable and fair debate, but not necessarily an equal time debate. These four good people are applying for a very serious job, and we want to hear what their vision for Ontario is. Part of my role is to play debate cop, here to arrest over-canned talking points immediately. But when they say something interesting, or oppose each other's point of view in a persuasive way, I'll give them as much time as they need to finish their thought. And I will give each candidate substantial time to make a closing argument, three minutes or so. An unfiltered chance to state their case to whatever audience they want to make it to. I want to stress one final thing. This is not a roast or an accountability session. We're not here to bust you. We're here to reveal you to people. Our goal is simply this, to help liberals make an excellent choice. Candidates, welcome to the Hurley Burley. I am so appreciative of your time today. Thanks, Thanks for, for having, having us here. here. Long time listener, first time caller. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's great to have you on, Yasser. It's a lot of fun. So let's start this off with just a, a simple thing that will get us all warmed up. I'm always interested in this question when I meet people. Let me start with you, Ted. Boxers Which politician, briefs? Canadian or not, <laughs> living or dead, do you most admire? You're going to be surprised by this answer. Okay. René Levesque. Okay. Because he earned trust as a TV journalist by, you know, explaining the world uh, to people watching uh, TV in, in French on CBC. And yeah. uh, that, I think, launched him into, helped him succeed in, in politics. So that's that journalist way of doing politics that I, I really like and I aspire to. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Bonnie. Who's a politician you Well, I don't think it'll be any surprise that I'll say Hazel McCallion, who was a friend and a mentor to me, and I think she paved the way for a lot of women in politics, but also created a meritocracy at the city of Mississauga. If you did the work, you succeeded, and you had every opportunity, and she was somebody that uh, became revered, not just respected. She was truly a force of nature, and that's why they called her the hurricane. So hard mm -hmm. not to admire a woman who broke every barrier at a time where women weren't even in the workplace. And here she rose to such incredible levels. I think she's somebody that we can all admire and learn from. And I'm um, very fortunate to, to have been, to learn under her and consider her a friend and a mentor. Mm. Good. Cool. Nate? It would be Lester Pearson for a number of reasons. I don't know that he would get elected today in quite the same way, but he was incredibly serious and thoughtful in his politics, accomplished a great deal both before he became prime minister, but also as prime minister. I can't think of a tenure of any prime minister where more was accomplished, lasting change for our country. And, you know, going into politics, if one could do even one small piece of any of that, I think one would have had a very successful political career. Great career. Yes, sir? I'm going to say Pierre Elliott Trudeau uh, because he gave us the gift of charter rights and freedom. Uh, I came to Canada in 1988. The charter was six years old at that time. And I feel that that document has defined me as to who I am as a Canadian. Uh, because I didn't know Canada before the Charter, and I've seen the evolution, the, the growth of the Charter. I've read a lot about what went into it, the great constitutional debates that took place that resulted in Charter, and it really feels that um, the decision that my parents made to come to a, a country where rights are always protected uh, was a result of this great document that we call Charter of Rights and Freedom, the most... Um, Imperfect, perfect document. Mm. One of the most fascinating times I had in politics was in the early 80s. I was just getting involved, and Trudeau was hosting these first ministers' summits, and the premiers and the prime minister were sitting around a table live on national TV for days at a time 
debating their vision of the country and their understanding of the country. Mm-hmm. What a fascinating thing that was to watch. i got to say I got involved in the Liberal Party because of Pierre Elliott Trudeau as well. I knocked on doors because his Minister of Multiculturalism was Stanley Hydash, Dr. Stanley Hydash, and he was Polish. Right. And God knows Polish was multicultural back then, and I thought, wow, this really speaks to me. Mm-hmm. Here's a man who speaks to justice and charter of rights, mm-hmm. um, human rights for all Canadians, um, and his min- Minister of Multiculturalism is Polish. So I knocked on doors. I don't know if I was 16, 15, because a friend of mine in mm-hmm. school said, hey, my uncle needs some help this weekend. Want to come knock on doors and drop brochures for me? And I signed on because I thought it was kind of cute. And uh, they, there we have it. Then I learned more about the party and the leader and been here since. I'm unequivocally the oldest person in the room. No, no you're okay. not. That's terrible. <laughs> uh, so um, you've all had an extremely unique experience on this campaign that most Ontarians will never have of traveling the whole province, big places, small places, meeting people, in the places they live, in the places they work. Uh, remarkable thing. Nate, what have you learned through that process? What's what, what's a new understanding you have since meeting, since going through that process of seeing the province and meeting those people? Well, it's a big province, number one, and the idea of the Liberal Party across the province, it, people have a very different idea of what the Liberal Party is, who the Liberal Party serves, and where you are in certain parts of this province Politicians don't get to every part of the province so very often, and people feel that they don't have a voice in quite the same way. And you know that if you're in politics, you know that that takes place. You know that people are out there that don't feel represented. Going in, I knew that the party was in a challenging state. I didn't know quite how bad it was and how so many people feel unrepresented and have felt unrepresented and haven't felt listened to in quite the same way. And I think a consequence of us all showing up repeatedly into different communities has helped to address some of that, but you can't be everywhere and four of us can't be everywhere. And so that's a real, that idea of building an active presence in every community is going to be an ongoing challenge for us. Yeah, so you know Ottawa Centre like the back of your hand, but now you've gone out and met the province. What did you learn from it? It's a, it's a big, beautiful, and diverse province. Ontario has changed a lot, and is continuing to change for better. And one thing that I have learned a lot, that the, when it comes to macro issue issues, they're the same. Access to healthcare, especially doctors and nurses, you know, emergency rooms, smaller class sizes for our children with special needs education for the kids who need it, affordability, housing. Those issues are the same. However, they apply, the solution set apply differently in different parts of the province. And I think one of the mistakes that I'm starting to realize that past governments have, have made, the current government under Doug Ford is making, is that we come for solutions that work really well in big, large urban centers like Toronto and Ottawa, but they are not as applicable in smaller communities. And we need to be far more uh, nimble as to how we apply those solutions. And they may cost more, they may require different tactics and strategies to implement, but in order to ensure equity to people who live in all parts of the province, whether it's rural Southwest Ontario or Northwest Ontario, we need to be quite thoughtful about making sure that the, the way we think we can have access to family doctors or family health teams in Northwest Ontario is not the kind of solution that will apply in downtown Toronto. And so that difference is becoming very clear and stark to me. Right. You know, Bonnie, I, I'm interested in your take on this whole, what you learned from going around the province thing, but just picking up on, on what Yasser said. You know, my experience in Ottawa and in Queen's Park was that everybody who's involved in a major decision in the federal government lives in Ottawa. That's right. Staff live in Ottawa, bureaucrats live in Ottawa, politicians mostly live in Ottawa. Same thing in Queen's Park. The, you know, daily, the core group of the government, they're all Torontonians, downtowners mostly. You know, it's really hard to keep a perspective of the whole province in that circumstance. Mm-hmm. Anyway. I think you're right. And I think outside of GTA, um, people feel that the party is too Toronto centric. And even Ottawa feels. Li- 
uh, left behind, neglected, and isolated. I've learned how beautiful Ontario is. I've fallen in love with so many small towns and so much beauty. Kenora, oh my gosh, I, can't, I love to live up there. Uh, Almont, I think they film Hallmark movies. They're Godrich, so, Simcoe, so many beautiful towns that I've had the opportunity to visit. We all have, and that I've been very grateful for that experience. But like the, the guys have said, Everywhere we go, people feel isolated. Um, they feel neglected. They feel not, not listened to. Politicians come in once and then they don't see us again. And there was a time when all those small com towns, small rural communities, all voted liberal. They've forgotten that now because I've asked them, well, how do you vote? You feel isolated and neglected. How do you vote? Well, we vote conservative. We always have. And I said, well, why? What has your MPP done for you? Have they brought in investment? Have they brought in jobs? Have they given you funding to build a new water treatment plant? And the answer is always no. And I said, so why do you vote? Are you?" And they said, well, we always have to our most recent memory. But that's not the case, because certainly more than two decades ago, they were voting liberal. And I said, would you be open to a party who will be present and who will be listening to you and create policies that will speak to your needs. And I, I think Yasser has just said, you know, those issues we feel here are far more acute particularly in the North, we think we have trouble finding a, a family doctor. And we know that 2 million Ontarians don't have a family doctor. Imagine up in the North, um, in, the, in the small towns and communities there, they're in competition with each other to find a doctor and then retention. Retaining that talent is even more difficult. And so, you know, we've got a lot of ideas on how to do both and whether it's uh, paid tuition and multi-service agreements. And I know uh, Dr. Adil Shamji has put forward a lot of ideas I'm going to adopt as well because He's certainly the authority on these things, having worked up there. So we're very grateful for the knowledge and expertise that he brings to the table. But the beauty of our province, the resiliency of the people, and the need is so great. It's similar, but different in the sense that it's far more acute and more in more remote places. But there is always that Toronto-centric lens that, you know, we get elected to power because we mine vote-rich areas and other areas feel neglected. And we will never form government again if we're not present in the small towns, rural communities, northern communities, speaking to them and speaking to their issues and listening. Even to farmers, for instance. We used to, we used to hold farming communities and I we don't get, speak I to, get their to their issues the I want to get to the rural piece in a sec, Bonnie, but just let me hear, Ted, on what this experience has been like for you. Well, um, the Kingston the, expert, the Kingston expert who uh, represents an urban and the a rural Kingston whisperer, riding. maybe given your electoral record in <laughs> yeah, 2011 right. and we 2018. Can talk about that too. <laughs> 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 well, let me start by saying I was listening to your interview of Merritt Stiles yeah. a couple of weeks ago, and she was saying how many ridings she's been to, and I, I think, gosh, all of us leadership candidates have been to way more ridings right. <laughs> twice <laughs> <laughs> and twice to three times. And we right. kept running into each other. Yeah. Keep, yes. <laughs> So uh, this leadership contest, the way it's been structured, is, structured has been very, very helpful, uh, healthy for the uh, for the Liberal Party, the local riding associations. Uh, they've been very active. Uh, typical dormant riding association has probably had half a dozen events over the course of the last year, as as each of us has has passed through. Yeah. Um, but it is uh, kind of like what Yasser said. There there are common problems. Everybody's struggling with uh, housing and affordability, healthcare capacity, addictions, uh, climate crisis, education, but it comes in different flavors. And when I compare, I, I travel and I say, oh, uh, you talk to some farmers and, oh, it's, your problems are a little bit the same, but they're different from farmers in my riding or people who are trying to find a place to rent in my riding. Um, and that comparison is, is really important. It's really important to understand the different flavors of all of these problems across the, across the province so that when we put forward solutions, uh, it's not a solution that just works for, for one, part of the, one part of the province. And so you put forward, I think it's important for us to put forward policies and then travel around and, and let people criticize them and say, oh, this doesn't work in our region. Our region's a bit different. And that's how the policies get better. That's how they should get better. For those of you who follow what's going on in tech spaces, these last 10 or 11 months have been dominated by one major headline, generative AI. If you've somehow missed the 3 million and one articles and news stories about it, here's a primer. Gen AI can synthesize text and voice, write ad copy, not this one, mind you, 
create photos, and even compose its own music, according to the inputs you feed it. More than a little revolutionary, eh? Maybe you've noticed your industrious friends at Air Quotes Media use it to create our weekly Twitter visuals for Curse of Politics. Yeah, I still call it Twitter. Sue me, Elon. Gen AI has smartly positioned itself as a way to save time and jumpstart ideas. Our experience would bear that out. But a lot of people have genuine fears about its biases, its ability to propagate misinformation, intellectual property and copyright infringement, as well as security and privacy concerns. So, a couple of weeks ago, the federal government introduced a shiny new voluntary code of conduct for generative AI to quell some of those fears. All signatories to the code commit to achieve these things, transparency, fairness and equity, safety, accountability, as well as human oversight and monitoring in all Gen AI programming development. Why am I even talking about this? Well, for a number of weeks now, I've been telling stories about how our presenting sponsor, TELUS, invests in groundbreaking technologies. Over $240 billion since the turn of the millennium, with the focus squarely on innovation and expanding services. Not a surprise, then, that TELUS became the first and only telecom to sign on to the new AI code of conduct, with their sights set firmly on fair, equitable, and responsible use. Hurley Burleyites, you know that with most things, but especially on investing in items with social purpose, TELUS likes to be first. Put simply, TELUS believes the transformative power of AI, when used appropriately, is going to produce better outcomes in so many aspects of our lives. Maybe the best way to sum it all up? It'll make the future friendly. Okay, let's stick with this theme, and I'll stick with you, Ted, to start this off, because, I mean... Bonnie started us down a rich vein here. I know this very well because when I was tasked with trying to find a winning path for the 2014 election campaign, it was eminently clear that former bastions of the party like the Southwest were gone. Um, and that if we were going to win an election in 2014, it was going to be by maximizing the GTA and the other urban areas of the of the province, uh, but not the urban areas in the Southwest. Um and that's a big change for the Liberal Party. So I know that everybody would like a party that rep that was strong throughout the whole province. But there's a big problem here with rural Ontario. And it isn't just a problem for the Ontario Liberal Party. It's a problem for center, center-left parties generally all across North America. And... Um, and that is that rural people, even though they may care about the things we're talking about, housing, healthcare, those things, they're not buying what we're selling. They're not interested in us. Is it values? Is it other issues that get in the way of them attaching themselves to us? What is it about the affinity that rural voters have for conservative parties and the disinterest they have in the Liberal Party, Ted? Let me, let me give you some specific examples of how we can connect better with, with rural Ontario. And then I want to give you a kind of bigger picture philosophy of what I think the Liberal Party should be when it comes to this issue. Uh, I think that we can connect with rural areas by doing things like connecting with farmers who want to preserve uh, prime agricultural land. Um, it's something that I put out in my policy uh my policy suite, uh, an idea to preserve farmland using uh, farmland easements, uh, preserving prime agricultural land by stopping urban sprawl and increasing housing density in cities. I think that if you connect with farmers and talk to them, they probably think that Doug Ford is focused on the city, focused on Toronto. And I think there's an opportunity there, there to, to get in. Housing is another issue that is very important in rural areas. We may not think of um, homelessness or, or lack of housing as a particularly rural issue, but it is. It is. And in eastern Ontario, the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus has an idea to, to build 7,000 new community housing units in the next seven years. And that's something that I think the province should be looking at to support uh, a rural need. But the bigger picture, so before I get to the bigger picture, let me just say that there are a lot of opportunities to do a better job of connecting with rural areas than the Ford government is doing. But the bigger thing that I see for the Liberal Party is 
The Liberal Party should be a party that fights against polarization. The Liberal Party should be a party that uh, makes progress by uniting people behind some common goals. And one of the uh, ways that society is polarizing, and there are many, but one of the ways is the urban-rural divide. And I think the Liberal Party should take as one of its uh, tasks in the long run to bridge that divide. Just like the Federal Liberal Party was very successful in bridging the French-English divide in Canada during the 20th century. And that allowed it to be very spectacularly successful during the 20th century as the party that was able to bridge that divide and find commonalities. I think that the Provincial Liberal Party should be looking forward over the coming decades and thinking about how to bridge uh, the urban-rural divide. Mm. Bonnie, you're going to be out there, you're going to be trooping through the countryside and you're going to be going to farm shows and country fairs. Hey, I got my cowboy gonna, boots. People are going to say, I really like that lady, but I don't vote liberal. So, um, <laughs> as you know, David, um, I'm related to Bob Nixon and uh, he's come out and endorsed me and, I, and I'm very grateful for that. But visiting him and just in Paris, Ontario a couple of weeks ago, he said, Bonnie, this is liberal country. It's rich with liberals. Don't give up on us here. Brant County, St. George's, uh, Simcoe, Haldeman, Brantford, etc. They're here. And I had expected, you know, four, five, six people in the room when I came out yeah. to those communities and yeah. roomfuls of people, roomfuls. I think it takes a spark. It just takes a, someone of interest. And yes, uh, I think, Nate, you always say this, it happened in 2015 with Justin, and we can we can accomplish that here in Ontario provincially again in 2026, because I know we can win. It's there for us. Uh, but we have to be present. And I think that is the biggest complaint. Is it because we're too progressive? Is it because we're not seen as uh, speaking to their issues. We're a big tent party. We have room for everyone, everyone's ideas. Um, I think we lost track of the small towns, the rural communities and the farming communities, and they weren't represented on our policy platforms, and we weren't present, and they do feel isolated. So if we show up in the county fairs and the tractor pulls and, you know, the uh, livestock uh, uh, um, rankings, you know, the, uh, the competitions they have, um, I'd be happy to be out there with my jeans and cowboy boots uh, and uh, speak to the farmers. And they want to hear from us that we support them. We're losing farmland daily. They want farmland protected, not just Greenbelt, but farmland. They want to know that we believe in um, supply chain management um, and we'll support them through succession planning. If their kids don't want to stay on the family farm, what will happen? Will we protect that land? They want to know that we have uh, business risk management programs so that they get crop insurance and they get incentives to replace their equipment. These are specific policies that have, are of interest to them and we stop speaking to them uh, to what their needs are in local communities. But I think it takes a presence. Um, Ted is the only one of us that has a seat. Three of us don't. And I spoke to John Fraser. I said, you know, if one of the three of us should get elected, what's the plan? We go out and get a seat to be present in the house. He said, Bonnie, go and rebuild the brand. Be present in all the local towns, communities, northern communities. You know, be that spark. Speak to them about the issues. There's, you know, there'll be time enough to get a seat in the house at the right time. But they want to see us. They want us to rebuild trust and confidence in our message. Cool. Yeah, sir, I'm going to put this really hard and direct to you. Because it's the thing that's on my mind. So I want to know what you're thinking about it, which is Thomas Frank, who's a political scientist, sociologist I really admire in the States, wrote a book called What's the Matter with Kansas? Um, about why does Kansas vote reliably Republican, given its poor economy and the fact that Republicans don't literally do anything for the place. And his answer was values. His answer was that... Um, the Republicans get people on religion and they get people on guns and they get people on uh, choice and they get people on all these kinds of things. And so they vote against their economic interest because of their other interests. As they did with Trump. Can we win in rural Ontario if we're the party of uh, privacy for trans kids at school? We, we can win. And we have won in the past. Remember, we did used to hold seats in 
rural Ontario and southwest Ontario. But were Ontario. we as downtown a progressive option then as we are now? So here's the thing. I think there's the two things that needs to happen, um, David. One is we have to show up. Bonnie's absolutely right. We have to show up. And not once, not twice, but multiple times. And we need to listen to them. Right? Listen to their ideas. Listen to their way of life. I was just last weekend, was canvassing Ontario Liberal members in Wallaceburg, Ilderton, Strathroy, Chatham. The number of people said to me like, wow, you're the first Liberal who showed up at our door. And I said, yeah, you elect me as the leader and this is the kind of work we're going to do. That's what David Peterson told me. He said, are you ready to keep going into these smaller communities again and again and again? The answer is yes. So first of all, let them see, start seeing themselves reflected in our party as, as opposed to the other way around. The second thing is we got to get away from this whole notion that we have developed in the Liberal Party is that we got into the business of telling people how to live their lives. I didn't get into politics to tell people how to live their lives. My job is to make their life easier to live, right? And for me, and I've been saying this in campaign, that where the Liberal Party at its very best is coming up with practical solutions that will improve your quality of life. And in provincial politics, the issue sets are very well defined. It's healthcare. It doesn't matter where you live, you should get access to healthcare closer to where you live when you need it. Same thing with education. So I think we need to put our focus on those issues, and I'm confident that people will see that we can do so while they build the life that they want to build, and we respect that that diversity of our province in an inclusive way. And that's where I f- feel that we need to come back to as a party uh, in terms of championing practical ideas that focuses on improving people's lives. Okay. Nate, you're batting clean up on this lineup. Well, it's all about building trust and rebuilding relationships. And you don't rebuild that trust by lecturing people. So that's, I think, to your point around how we engage in politics and our approach to politics. No one wants to be lectured at regardless of the disagreement. And there are ways of coming at that disagreement. I think of my wife's family. You mentioned county fairs. We were just at the Brigden Fair for Thanksgiving weekend. I literally have a T-shirt that says Thanksgiving weekend tradition because it is. And... When I think of, take the idea of gay marriage, for example, did Lampton County come to that faster than Beaches East York? There's no way. But I can tell you that Aunt Lynn and Aunt Jamie are loved in the family. And did Grandma Marion think of them as roommates a good good amount of her life? Of course. But loved Aunt Jamie and Aunt Lynn. And so I, 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 I think we at our peril, engage in that kind of lecturing and suggest that those values can't transcend geography. When we look at, let's talk about ideas and the idea of a progressive liberal party, because we we have to have a progressive liberal party, I think, to win the next election. There's no doubt in my mind, when you look at the lay of land across Ontario, we need a progressive liberal party to be the alternative to Doug Ford and a serious, credible, progressive alternative to Doug Ford, because there are three potential alternatives. Now, when you talk about ideas, though, and you go into Kenora, and, and I was there in Kenora having breakfast with Bob Nault, he'll tell you people don't call themselves progressives. But if you talk to them about health care and education, talk about access to family health teams and family doctors or lack of access in that case, they're very progressive. They want investments in public health care. They want the same things, different solutions depending upon the community, but at a high level, They want the same things that we want in a very progressive way, but they aren't going to self-describe as progressive. So when it comes to ideas, you have to meet people where they're at and explain to them, this is how we are going to deliver and solve your problems and not just say, we're the progressive option, come vote for us, you're progressive, I'm progressive. That's not going to work. Ideas have to be, here's how we are going to address the challenges in your life and here are the investments we're going to make to address those challenges. When it comes to values, it's competence. People want seriousness. People are busy in their own lives. They can't be looking over their shoulder and saying, "What? they're selling off the green belt. What, 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 what's this scandal today? People are busy with their own lives and they want a government that's going to look after the things that have to be looked after and not wake up every morning going, do I have to hold this government accountable tomorrow? You've, you've got to have compassion. There's no question about it. Rural communities are deeply compassionate for their neighbors. There's a neighborliness that I think is more significant in rural communities than, than anywhere else, actually, based on my experience. And, and lastly, and this is the most important value in politics, integrity. And 
when you look at, I'll, I'll pick on Stu, a hog farmer in Listool. He doesn't agree with all my politics. He's joined my campaign because of my approach to politics, that idea of integrity, that you, you say what you mean and you do what you say you're going to do. And we have a moment, I think Ted's exactly right, when we talk about Doug Ford, he's you know now completely walked it back because of the terrible politics to it. But when he was looking to build on the green belt and we're losing prime agricultural land, you've got the Ontario Federation of Agriculture that is talking about building density and protecting prime agricultural land. They are taking a constituency of voters for granted, and we should be building bridges and rebuilding those relationships. But when you look at the approach, that idea of integrity, integrity matters more than geography, and how you act matters more than where you're from. A handshake still matters. Your word, your reputation matters, especially in rural communities. And when Doug Ford stands up there and says, the people have spoken, I'm going to protect the green belt, and then does the exact opposite for brazenly self-interested reasons to benefit friends, that undermines trust, especially in rural communities. And I suppose the last thing I would say, it's, it's values, it's ideas. It really is just the hard work of showing up. At Brigden Fair, Marilyn Gladu had a booth. There was no liberal booth to be found. You've got to have a visible act of presence and it's got to be people. It can't be a staffer that we run at the last minute just to have someone run the banner. You, you got to have some. My father-in-law will say, guy. yeah, <laughs> but, but, but my father-in-law has said, and, and, and you gave up on us before we gave up on you. And, and there's some truth to that. Like we've got to show up and we've got to have a full eyes wide open understanding. We don't necessarily win in the next election in Sarnia Lambton. Yeah, we do. I it, think we do. Are you, did you, you wanted to jump I in? Did, I did want to jump in because I think uh, Doug Ford walked it back because he got caught. He wasn't sorry. He was sorry he got caught. Um, I think what we need to convey to people in all small towns and communities is that the Liberal Party cares about people. All people, and we care about values, of course, but we care about more marginalized people, uh, families, uh, entrepreneurs, yes, but they're more important to us than big business. And they're more important to us than rich friends and getting a, giving them a payback for their donations, which is what Doug Ford is, his agenda. I think they've completely lost their moral compass if they had one to begin with. Mm. Look, I think uh, we've discussed this before, all four of us, um, as we've traveled the province. You can, you can sense the anxiety in the province. It's palpable. People are struggling mm -hmm. right now. And especially as we're coming out of the p pandemic. Families are struggling to get find a family doctor or nurse. Kids are struggling in overcrowded classrooms. Young people working two or three jobs and struggling to pay for rent and groceries. There are some real challenges. And I strongly believe a liberal party with a leader who could relate to people, who's just like them, who knows how to work hard and how to build a life from, from nothing mm. and provide practical solutions, not try to solve all the world's problems. And mm. I think that's the problem we get into because we, we got to have an answer for everything. And sometimes it's okay to say we don't have the answer for this. But first and foremost, focus on the things that people rely on the best. Do I have a family doctor? Am I waiting with my kid 20 hours in a wait room to see a doctor in an emergency room? If that ER is open in a small community in rural Ontario, are my kids with special needs getting the attention he or she deserves so they have a shot in life? This is what we need to focus on. Under my leadership, we're going to be really focused and disciplined to come up with practical solutions that works across the province so people themselves reflect and say, ha, ah, there may be relief on the way. So I found myself gazing at a landline phone the other day. You know, the modern successor to the black, bakelite, rotary dial appliance that dragged the world into the modern era of communications. Plugs into the wall, has a dial tone, etc. It occurred to me that it's a slowly vanishing creature. Perfectly functional and still quite useful, but outclassed by its sleek, wireless 5G cousins. I mean, cell phones have come an awfully long way since those enormous gray things with the stubby antenna we used to call shoe phones back in the 80s. A lot of tech is in the same sort of transition period right now and will be for some time to come. Cars, airplanes, even trains. Yes, trains. Locomotives might look alike, but our sponsor CN will tell you that there's a vast difference between the behemoths that have pulled trains for decades and their modern counterparts. The older ones run on DC or direct current. The new ones are AC, alternating current. 
The details of the difference are pretty complicated, mostly to do with the laws of physics. But put it this way, AC locomotives have a lot more oomph. They can pull heavier loads, getting up to cruising speed much faster, and they're way lighter. AC locomotives are also a lot more reliable. So CN, which is constantly reinvesting in its equipment and infrastructure, has been going for AC. CN's new winter plan states that AC locomotives now comprise about 55% of the railway's fleet. More or less the same can be said for the thousands of newer, higher capacity hopper cars used to move grain. That's the way of things. By purchasing better, stronger, more efficient technology, CN stays ahead of the competition, which is good for its customers. And I know I've said this before, but it bears repeating. CN trains leave the station on time and arrive on time. Period. Can I ask? Right. I'm going to remind you. I'm going to remind you all of this conversation. When, in the election campaign when you're shuttling around the uh, <laughs> GTA and occasionally venturing down the 401. Um. <laughs> but, but on that point, you, you got to ask, we have to engage and rebuild absolutely everywhere, but you've got to see this as, we got nine seats at Queen's Park. Mm. You've got to see this as there are seats we win immediately and there are seats that we work to win in the medium to long term. And the idea that we can snap our fingers and rebuild and win 124 seats, we're kidding ourselves. And I mentioned Starry Lantern just because I, I know it better, but the idea that we win in Mississauga Center, yeah, we, if we, we're not a real party if we don't win can in Mississauga Can we win the government next time, though? Yes, or you we suggest can. Yes. we can't win yes, the government we next time? We, we can win the government next okay. time. But the idea of, re, of winning ridings that we have literally given up on for two decades mm. is a really big challenge, and we shouldn't just say, well, of course we're going to win. Mm. That you've got to put the work in to win, and that work has to be put in over many years, and you don't necessarily win in 2026 in ridings like that. But we should. But that, win. We Bonnie, I want to switch topics. Bonnie, you had a you had a comment about the green belt, so mm -hmm. I just want to go here with you. It's 2023, whatever it is right now, <laughs> and <clears throat> so the election's not for two and a half years in Ontario. This scandal gets worse. We got the criminal investiga RCMP, RCMP investigation. investigation. Now, I know from personal experience that an RCMP investigation into a politician can be bullshit. But still, um, it's... How so? Oh, they were, Ralph the investigation to Ralph Goodale Ralph in the Goodell. 2006 yeah. oh, uh, yes. election campaign uh, is a pretty scarring incident for me. But right. nonetheless, this looks very serious. Right, looks like right. it's getting more and more serious. What will be the relevance of this in an election in 2026? Uh -huh. What will still matter? Integrity, trust, trust with voters. I mean, I think it'll be the ballot question. Do you, can you trust this government to keep their word? Do they have integrity? I mean, I, I thought going into this, the ballot question would be affordability. And yesterday has been talking about you know, people are struggling. As mayor, I'm probably the most accessible level of government. I hear from people every day. They stop me in the grocery store. They're telling me they can't purchase certain items, no meat this week because they're struggling. I thought the question would be, is your life more affordable today than it was five years ago before Doug Ford? The answer clearly is not. But it's evolved from that, David. Now people are looking at a government that's corrupt, that they can't trust, that doesn't have integrity. And I think we just have to show them an ethical, trustworthy, uh, viable alternative. And I think we can do that. And back to a point that Nate was making earlier, we can win those ridings. We were strategically allocating resources because those resources were scarce. We need to build a war chest and we need need to allocate resources to all ridings. We need to support all ridings. Yes, not just those we think are clearly winnable, the tier one ridings. Resources have to be fairly allocated. And if we had the $10 million in the bank that the, the Ford government does today, we would be spreading it around the entire province as well. So all ridings, in my view, are winnable. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you a completely different take on what we should be doing towards the next election because I think that... A lot of people are worried about things they need help for today. People can't find a family doctor. They can't afford the rent increase that they're facing next month. Uh, they want to need. They need help today. People are worried. Young people, old people, worried about the climate crisis. They know that uh, we have to cut our emissions by a half, according to scientists, uh, by 2030. And the election is one third of the way to 2030. So we can't wait until 2026 to say, we've got this great plan, just wait until we get elected. Um, and so I think people want to see us uh, fighting Doug Ford right away. And that's why I think it is important to have a seat so that people can see somebody toe-to-toe -to -toe against Doug Ford in the legislature pushing him mm. 
to do the right thing right now. Uh, I think people will need to see that. And, and I think that's going to be important in, even in the lead up to the election to help us earn votes and earn trust. Mm. Uh, we need to be forcing Doug Ford one way or the other to build more energy storage. Uh, when it comes to climate change, just as a, as a, for example, we need to be forcing him to uh, change the rules so that more housing gets built or, or changing the funding for, uh, we could even start f in areas where he might be vulnerable, like rural Ontario, funding for community housing in rural Ontario. We need to be pushing him every way that we can. Last, last year, I was standing up speaking about ODSP and about the, uh, the cutoff threshold for the 50% clawback. clawback. It was $200. And then in the fall, I was the only MPP to talk about that in the legislature. And in the fall economic statement, it was raised to $1,000. It's those things that we need to be pushing on. People expect it because they're struggling right now. And they want to say, what can you do for me now, as well as in the long term? Okay. Lingering impact of the Green Belt story? Where is it? The next election will be fought on trust and ethics. I agree with, with Bonnie. And that's why I think this particular leadership race for Ontario Liberal Party is really important because I think Ontarians are relying on us to elect the most trustworthy leader. Uh, that's the basic uh, price of entry um, into the Premier's office. Right. And we need to really make sure that our leader stands... How do I know in, who that is? Uh, how do I know who that is? <laughs> Track record experience. Yeah. yeah, and 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 political instinct, making sure making sure that we have exhibited person exhibited political instinct that is that is different than than Doug Ford, somebody uh, who stands in stark contrast to Doug Ford, and be able to prosecute him for all his failures when it comes to uh, breaking the trust of Ontarians and all the ethical issues that he's facing right now. Mm. I, I think there's a way to counter uh, what Doug Ford is doing. Doug Ford won't be trusted, but if you want to accuse him of not being trustworthy, you have to be trustworthy yourself. And we can enhance that by how we, how we behave. I think we can do that by uh, not being over the top and being fair, but firm when we criticize other parties. I think that we need to meet people in person and let them, let them quiz us. Do a town hall type of meeting as opposed to a rally with lots of cheering and pizzazz. No, let, 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 people poke, <laughs> let people poke and prod. It's, yeah, the exact opposite of a Ford Fest. Exactly. I think we need to be putting, we need to talk about smaller issues as well as larger issues. I have to say that in the last legislative session, the Liberal Caucus, because of our small numbers, uh, we didn't get to talk about automobile thefts. That's something that's oh. bothering a lot of people. Um, we need to put forward fearless policies that might lose a couple of votes. Like, I think we should get rid of single detached zoning across the province. There's going to be pushback, legitimate pushback, legitimate concerns. But I think we should be willing to lose a couple of votes because we need to earn the trust of Ontarians that we're going to take the housing crisis, treat it like a crisis, and treat it seriously. And I, I would pick up on that because I think to your question in terms of how what's the staying power of the Greenbelt scandal? Yeah. And I think there are really three ways of thinking about it. There are certain parts of this province where people deeply care, and rightly so, about protecting and expanding the Greenbelt. That is an election issue for those voters, and Ford has eviscerated support in those communities. Right. And we have to be credible, consistent, and clear that we are the party, and our leader has credibility on this file, to protect and expand the Greenbelt. Crystal clarity on that. I think we've all been unequivocal about that. And I also think that this is the tip of the iceberg. Depending this is upon just the, the date. This is just the first of scandal. We've been crystal this is clear just on. <laughs> the first yeah. scandal that we're seeing that will unravel. The Green Belt is the first one. The MZO scandal is yet to come, and we've only started to dissect Ontario Place. Now, that's not that something that will resonate in Fort Francis, however, but certainly in the GTA and beyond. They're very interested in knowing what happened there and why the residents of Don Mills weren't consulted. Um, and why we signed a 95-year lease with an Austrian company and what services are going to be provided at this spa and what about a billion-dollar parking lot. I mean, there are so speculate. many. But, right, but I, exactly. But I, there but are so I, many. I but, and I will also, let me finish. Yeah. I'll, uh, you know, so I think that any one of us here in this room has entirely more, uh, more solid moral compass and integrity and trustworthiness than the current government um, at Queen's Park. And, and so no one's going to disagree with that. Here's, but, where the, but the, sorry, here's where the rubber hits the road on this. In one respect is you two have had a conflict publicly about fundraising, right? In which you announced you raised a lot of money and... Uh, more coming. More coming. And you had some issues about how that money was raised. Not just so, myself. I, I know... I yeah, want to start this conversation too, yeah. maybe with you, Yasser, because you were there 
in 2016 when this whole fundraising thing fell apart on us in the wind government, mm -hmm. right? And it was clear that we were raising money by a method that didn't stand up to public scrutiny. And when people saw what it was, they thought it was too close to the government. The nexus between the ask and the cash was too close to decision-making in government. Well, we relied on that system for money. And the party hasn't had any money fundamentally since we broke that down, right? Uh, since we changed those laws and stopped fundraising that way, we have not successfully in any way made the um, uh, adapted to the mass fundraising uh, success, for instance, that the federal liberals have. But money is so critical to success. You can have it and not win, but you won't win if you don't have it in an election campaign. So how are we going to fund ourselves in a way that still allows us to uh, contrast ourselves with Ford ethically? Well, David, the, we the, 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 David, the failure, the, our failure to modernize our fundraising does not justify that we go back to the same old cash for access system. You know, we worked really hard, as you remember, to put an end to cash for access. We put an end to corporate union donations. We significantly brought down maximum amounts of money. We prevented, we brought law against bundling. Ford undid all this, and that doesn't make it right. And we see the result of the kind of decision Ford is making in for the benefit of his own, own friends. And I think this is a challenge that we've, we've had with some of the fundraising in this campaign where bundling has been done, where related group of people have given large amount of money, maybe following the law that Ford created, but still going against the spirit of, of the intent uh, which was not to allow that kind of uh, influence. So I am I'm a candidate in this race, have put forward a, a plan to go further, to bring trusted integrity ban, to make sure that we don't allow for bundling, to make sure that we really modernize our party to fundraise in a way that brings more people into the tent. As we are trying to build a more big tent inclusive party, make sure a lot of people have voices as opposed to just few people with special interest. You yeah. can you can Bonnie, change. Yeah, no, Bonnie, that, I think it's fair to give you a shot. Yeah, here. no, I want to say a lot of things. First of all, I think it's well known if anyone donates to me, if they expect a special favor, they're going to be in for a very rude awakening. Uh, I don't conduct myself that way, and I certainly have an, I have a track record of saying, um, standing up for what I believe in the city of Mississauga. And I got to frankly say, I don't even know what bundling is. I've never even heard that term. Um, I, I accept donations from people not from corporations. And I think that everyone sitting here presently has followed all the rules to the T. And whether that means accepting uh, donations from people who are stakeholders in the home building business, I know Yasser has, I know Nate has, and I know Ted has, and I have. These are not villains. These are people we work with on a daily basis to get the job done. But I think we all all follow the rules to the T. Um, and could there be reforms in the future? Absolutely. My team and I are discussing what reforms we'd bring forward uh, fundraising as well. However, that said, why would we hamstring ourselves? Why would we handcuff ourselves today when they are out fundraising us 10 to 1? 10 to 1 that they can raise $4 million or $5 million in one evening in one evening, the kind of money we're going to need to fight the next campaign. We need a war chest. Every single one of us follows the rules as they are written. We will look forward to further future um, donation reform if it's required. But let's not handcuff ourselves now when we are going into what's going to be the fight of our lives with a very well-funded machine um, and uh, you know, outfunding us on a 10 to 1 ratio. Ted, you got any idea how we're going to find seven to ten million bucks? You know, in the I, next I, couple of years? I don't think it's about. Well, it, it's not just about the rules changing the rules; it's about trying to inspire people. And I have been able to raise a good amount of money without being in power, without being able to promise anything, except I will do a good job. I raised almost two hundred thousand uh, dollars up leading up to the. Uh, campaign last year for my riding association and my, my campaign. That's without holding the seat, uh, with uh, running for a party that didn't have official party status. Uh, and all I could promise was, vote for me, you'll get somebody who will do a very good job and make the, make the government better than it would otherwise be. 
Uh, and so it's about inspiring people. It's about standing up for for good things, having a, a trustworthy reputation, uh, having a reputation for competency. Uh, I think it's important to have all those things. You can. It's it's not just about the rules and leveling the playing field or whatever. It's you've got to inspire people that it's worth their time and energy and money uh, to to help you out and, and join your cause. Right. I've got one more point to add if I may. Sorry, Wait, Nate, just me yeah. first. Yeah. yeah, so the, the first point to make is it is about trust. And it's not just about trust as against Doug Ford. It's about of the three alternatives, who is going to be most trusted? And it's not just on the Greenbelt. It's also on fundraising. And it's the proximity and closeness with certain developers. And an example of bundling, for example, would be accepting nine donations from employees at one development corporation. That's an example of bundling, especially where they have business before your council. That's an example of bundling where there's a perception. I'm not suggesting that you are influenced in any way, Mayor Crombie, but there's a perception of influence that is problematic and, and is a political risk. Let's be honest about it. There's a political risk to that. Now, let's also be honest about why fundraising matters. We need to spend money, of course, but it's also an indication of support, not only total dollars, but how we go about fundraising and the grassroots nature to those donations. So I would say, have we raised as much as Mayor Crombie? No. And we haven't raised a million dollars yet, but we've raised over $400,000. We have over 1,200 donors, half of whom donated $200 or less. That's the sign of movement a m momentum and, and people believing in something and wanting to join and build something together. And that's what we're going to have to do to win the next election is have a, a whole swath of people who see politics as a way to make a difference and want to participate and contribute to it. So the very people you're talking about donating to my campaign to traditionally donated to me as a mayor and I've made decisions which only are in the best interests of my city to enhance what we've been asking at the city and the vote you're speaking of got us uh, increased parkland um, and a pedestrian access that we wanted. I would I've have raised a lot myself, of money. Though. I would have refused myself. I, I, there was That's... no need to. There was absolutely no need to. I have a crackerjack team of fundraisers. I'm not even told what level we're at. I, I meant to ask before we uh, came into the room, hey, how's our money going? Uh, they don't tell me what money comes in. They don't tell me who it's from because they don't want to compromise me, but it, which is the yeah, right thing okay. to do. And we've raised, raised over $1.1 million and we're going to keep going because I I hope we can find a way to change the rules so that money will be later transferred in. I'm not going to use it all, obviously, but I want to transfer it into the party. Let it be the seed money for the war chest we need to fight the next election. So, David, next election is going to be fought on trust and ethics, and money cannot buy either. You have to establish that trust by your actions, by your behavior, and by the connection and the context you build. One of the things that, that I would do as a leader what leaders used to do in the past is help fundraise for writing associations because in the end of the day, they're the one carry most of the weight when it comes to running localized individual campaigns. And we've neglected our writing associations. That's why our infrastructure is absolutely broken. So when I talk about transforming our party and making sure that we've got strong presence in all 124 writing associations, it's not only to build that connection with those communities, but raise money locally and so that people feel part of something. We cannot do politics the same old way. It's gotten us where we are right now. We have to try things differently. And part of rebuilding this party, part of modernizing this party expense, is to build those grassroots. At the expense of maximizing our fundraising? I, there's a balance that needs to be reached, uh, David. Um, and I really strongly feel that we, first and foremost, and I'm hearing this from our grassroots party members, they need to be feel like they're valued. That is not just the leader's office from Toronto telling them who's going to be their candidate, what's going to be the policy, and how the campaign is going to run. Guess what? That got us seven seats last election. David, I'm, not, I'm not running to be the, the leader of a caucus of seven or nine seats. And David, you've been in politics a very long time, and dollars matter. But at the end of the day, you got to win votes. And if people see a proximity to developers as a liability for Ford, and then they say this, they see the same thing with our leader and with us, there's a wide open lane for the NDP on this issue. I'm and, really and proud that's of the how you that I've election. been raising. And I think people are investing in my campaign because they think there's a good chance I might win, and they're behind me. And that's why people are investing in my campaign and donating to me. But I got a great team. They say the money's coming in strongly, and I'm very pleased about that. And because we need a strong fundraiser because we need to raise a war chest. Well, 
It's been a little over a year since we last heard from the original sponsor of this podcast, the Ontario Real Estate Association. But today they are back because Aurea has some big news to share. The biggest political affairs conference of the year, Aurea's powerhouse, is back. Taking place on November 28 at the Weston Harbour Castle in Toronto, Powerhouse is without a doubt the biggest and best political affairs conference in Canada, featuring some of the most influential names in politics in Ontario, Canada, and even internationally. This year, Aurea is scheduled to have Ontario's new Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing take the stage to share his thoughts on how we can build 1.5 million homes over the next decade to solve the housing crisis. Join Aurea to hear from Green Party leader Mike Schreiner, interim OLP leader John Fraser, and leader of the official opposition, NDP leader Marit Stiles. Heck, Aurea has even established a political panel that will feature none other than our very own Scott Reed of Curse of Politics Infamy. How cool is that? Tune in next week for Aurea's big announcement on their keynote speaker for this year. In 2019, it was President George W. Bush, so I can only imagine... Who will be headlining this year? Here's a hint. Think one of the biggest names in politics across the pond from the past decade. Aurea is looking forward to seeing all of you Hurley Burleyites at Powerhouse, the most exciting political affairs conference of the year, on November 28 at the Weston Harbor Castle. Go to aureapowerhouse.ca to purchase your tickets today. I want to say, go a slightly different direction now. I want to get a little... Um, a little less hot button, in fact, a lot less hot button, because you've been going around, and I'm sure everybody asks you about affordability and about housing and about health care, and I want to hear from all those things about you. But I also want to know, what's something you really, really care about that isn't newsy or topical that you would be thinking about when you were premier that nobody's thinking about right now, or not a lot of people are thinking about right now? Ted, what would that be for you? Well, my background uh, includes uh, work in, in sustainable energy. I'm, I'm currently the energy critic mm -hmm. uh, in the legislature. Uh, so uh, it's got my eyes on Minister Todd Smith. And I think that's something that people don't think about every day, but which is critically important uh, to the economy and to their everyday lives, is, is our energy system. It's big, it's complicated, it needs a lot of work. Uh, has a lot of constraints like cost and climate change. Uh, and that is something that I uh, have thought about a lot that I would continue to think about as premier that will affect a lot of people's lives, uh, just not in the everyday fashion. People expect the lights to turn on when they flip the switch, and that's mm -hmm. about all. Yeah. Uh, they expect their, their bills to be reasonable. Uh, but I will be focused on that. Uh, it's always be uh, a little focus on that in the back of my head. Nate? What would your, what's your the thing that is your thing? On a specific issue, I when I was an undergrad at Queens, I brought a police officer from New York State up to talk about prohibition and the challenges with prohibition. And he talked about how he'd spent his whole life fighting prohibition and he felt like he had wasted that life fighting prohibition because it was a failure. And I got elected, we changed the laws around cannabis. That's something we should talk more about as a federal liberal party sometimes, if we want to be more popular. But when it came to the opioid crisis and the toxic drug crisis, we weren't moving fast enough. And I pushed really hard. I was seen as a pretty radical liberal initially, talking about treating substance use as a health issue. Now police officers, chiefs, medical experts, families who have lost loved ones are all saying the very same thing. The mental health and addictions crisis is impacting communities all across Ontario now, small and large and in really unfortunate ways. And I was able to change the law. I had you know, initially more of a combative relationship with the government on this file and over time worked to compromise. And we drafted and passed legislation last fall that the government put forward as government legislation, but it was legislation that I drafted to divert people out of the criminal justice system and into the healthcare system to help save lives and, and treat substance use more as a health issue as it should be. And if we're going to treat it as the health issue and save lives to the greatest possible degree, well, which level of government is responsible for health? And there's a huge opportunity to 
not just leave municipalities to fend for themselves, ill-equipped to deal with this, but to actually show leadership and to support municipalities, to support families, and to save lives, and to fully and finally address the opioid crisis and in, 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 with the seriousness that it deserves. Cool. What about you, yes, sir? Internationally trained professionals. My family and I came 35 years ago. Both my parents were lawyers, and they, didn't, they couldn't practice a single day in Ontario. Right. Right? Their credentials were not recognized. They didn't have Canadian experience. So they did what a lot of families do, bought a small business, an, a motel in Niagara Falls, Ontario, which we lost in a recession. So then they had to dabble in real estate and this and that to, to provide for the, for the family. And 35 years later, seems like the needle has barely moved on that particular file. Every one of us knows so many internationally trained doctors and nurses and engineers and dentists and lawyers and accountants who are just, the morale has been taken away because they're driving Ubers or working in a lab. And it's a, it's a fix that is within our reach. We just need the will. And so when I was in provincial government and I agitated about that, and now that I am running for leadership, that I'm so determined to, to tackle um, once the premier of this province is to ensure that we create level playing field in terms of economic integration for the best and the brightest of the world that we're bringing to this province and to this country. They're, they want to give back as much as every, every one of us. And by not giving an opportunity, we're harming all of us. And so that's the one area that I am absolutely continues to think a lot about and wants to tackle it one for all, once for all. Interesting. Thanks, Yasser. Bonnie? Jobs. Um, answered measures, the word you use most often when I was in Parliament, I use the word jobs most often. As you know, I have a business background before I entered politics. I have an MBA and a director's degree, and I work at strengthening our economy, um, looking for new investment into my city. I would do so into the, into the province. I want to create opportunity. I want to ensure that we have an equal access for opportunity for everyone, equal access for everyone. Um, I want to bring um, prosperity back. Um, and I want to assure we have investment coming from all over the world, as I do quite successfully in my, in my city of Mississauga, uh, whether it's in ICT, whether it's in clean tech, advanced manufacturing, aerospace, or life sciences, because you know we have a little uh, niche in uh, biotech, biopharma in Mississauga. So jobs, and then because I'm mayor as well, creating those livable, walkable communities, 15-minute cities that people want to live in, that are affordable for people. And how do we bring more affordability to people's lives? How do we create cities where pe there are creative spaces where they can get outside and walk around or get on public transit? I mean, I'm trying to retrofit a city and embrace urbanization, density, intensification, and public transit, whereas a decade ago, decade ago it didn't exist. I remember listening to you on this podcast and then I texted you following I'm going to bring you into Mississauga today David. <laughs> Doesn't look like anything like that anymore. You know we are intensifying and em embracing um, heights and densities but in the right corridors right. We've allocated it. But I want to build a city that uh, my goal as mayor that was livable and walkable but a place where people have opportunity and that's why it was so important to me uh, to build the economy and attract investment so people had jobs, that they wanted to not only raise their children in my city, educate them, uh, and then that there were job opportunities for them and that they could afford the very housing uh, that some of them will be building because some of them will be going into skilled trades. We want everyone to be able to live, work, invest, um, uh, and uh, live, work, invest, and raise their families in every small town and community in, in Ontario. Speaking of living, raising, and working, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of talk about poverty. And in various ways, there's a lot of talk about what the level of various supports should be. Whether it's what should the level of the minimum wage be? Or what should the level of the disability benefit be we've been talking about? And, you know, Kathleen Wynne raised the question, should there be a basic income? in Ontario. What? And I was at Alistair Campbell, the author of Harris's Common Sense Revolution on the show a week or so ago, and talking about the cuts to welfare, mm -hmm. all of which raises the question 
Um, what's the least amount of money a person should have in Ontario? Like, what is the... Depends if they, on where you live. It varies in this province. Okay, well, tell me, give me any, for instance. Well... Like, what is it... What what should we be setting... Like, so, like it's a social assistance right now, it's almost like, what's the point of it at all, right? Because you can't remotely live on it. So, should it be at a different level? Should the minimum wage be higher? Or... I'd like to have that basic income pilot return so we can analyze the results. I think, I think it uh, had very positive um, findings. Uh, that's something we should look at. We're looking at fair wages, um, but I think Yasser's right that it does differ because, of course, cost of living differs across the province. So, should there be one, you know, minimum wage? Should it differ depending on economic circumstances? That's something I think we have to look at as well. Yeah, so I, I like that it was in our last platform that yeah. idea, and I think it's a good one to have a, a variable. A we did, a variable minimum wage that adjusts automatically with inflation so it doesn't become a political football and varies geographically uh, so that it's fairer. Mm. Income insecurity. What number would make sense in Toronto? In Toronto, it's, uh, it's probably like $20 an hour or something like that. I, that that I, analysis was done recently. It looked, yeah. it, it looked to me like it was about $40 an hour you <laughs> needed to make to pay, pay your expenses in the city of Toronto. We, we do already have different metrics that we can bring to bear. So the market basket measure does vary across the country and across the province, and for good reason, because the cost of living does differ in different places. Now, I, yeah, I know more about this file in some ways because in my time in federal politics, I co-chaired the All-Party Anti-Poverty Caucus. As part of that, I sort of led efforts to strengthen what we now call the Canada Workers' Benefit to lift tens of thousands of low-income workers out of poverty. And so when I take that same lens to provincial politics, where Ontario Disability Support Program, ODSP, Ontario Works. The idea of a basic income is one that we should work towards. There's no question about it. In the short term, though, we've got to look at existing programs and how do we strengthen them in two ways. One, how do we strengthen them on the total amount? So we just went through this back and forth. Sherry Torgman is helping us on, and on our team. She's one of the architects of the Canada Child Benefit. And she was saying, well, in a leadership, you probably don't want to be so prescriptive about a certain amount because you want to be properly costed and you want to make sure that, that the math works and, and that you're credible on this file. But the commitment should be to significantly increase these benefits, the rates to reduce poverty. And ODSP, Ford said 5%. We have, we, we have finally got it tied indexed to inflation. OW is still not indexed to inflation and there's no attempt to increase it at all. In fact, Ford last June just threw it under the bus, say, I don't like seeing all these people on, on OW. And so there's no question we need to strengthen, increase the rates by a significant degree. And two, make sure that the benefits are more accessible to people, that people aren't fighting, going to legal aid lawyers and fighting to get the benefits that they ultimately deserve. The idea of getting to a basic income is a noble idea, but fraught too. The basic income panel in BC said, hold on a moment, let's let's look at the benefit structure. We need a disability benefit, we need a worker's benefit. And the goal really where I think there's common ground, and I come from a perspective of advocating for a basic income, but where the common ground is we need a social safety net that leaves nobody behind. That's got to be the goal we all agree on. That's the starting point. And then what does that mean and how do we work towards it? How do, how do we pay for it to make sure that we are looking after those in the greatest need to the greatest possible degree? I think there's so, a bigger so, issue if I can address it. Um, Ontario, if you, I think this FAO report from last year, Ontario spends per capita less than other provinces on, on programs. Uh, and yet our personal marginal income tax is third in the country after Nova Scotia and Newfoundland, and the corporate income tax is about in the middle of the pack. So what's, what's the disconnect? Why do we spend less per capita? And I think the difference is productivity. It's our tax base. Uh, and I think the missing thing, how do we pay for all of this, is we have to increase productivity. Mm -hmm. How much can we make or do in one hour of work? And one of the problems we have in Canada and Ontario uh, is that uh, the private sector hasn't invested enough in research and development. So the tools and technology available to our, worker, our workers are behind that of other countries. We also, to improve productivity, we have to work on things like childcare. We're still working on childcare, $10 a day childcare. We have to improve schooling and training. We have to improve access to markets and financing. All of these things, we have to increase uh, uh, competition to spur on innovation. Uh, there should be a strategy to uh, uh, 
increase the top line, the revenue coming in. Because if we have money to pay for it, which is represented by the productive capacity of our economy, uh, we'll have the money to pay for these things that we should be pay paying for. We need to have a pros prosperous economy so that That's we can it. support a caring and fair society. And so we need to also talk about economic strategy. That's right. I think so you're this right is an on. important you're conversation. Dead on right there. Yeah, this is a very important conversation to have. Remember, because first we had the automation, and now we have the AI. Mm. coming in and that has a huge impact on productivity has a huge impact on on just the basic economics as to how our society on works jobs. in terms of on jobs and human <laughs> on resources jobs, yeah. and so so this is a really important conversation and my challenge right now with our social safety network is that it's become a patchwork and it is it's that's it is it's just trying to fill hopes holes and leaves most of the people who need the help and the support behind and that was the premise behind having that very thoughtful process to come up with a basic income pilot. Mm -hmm. I still remember engaging with Hugh Siegel and uh, how mm -hmm. helpful he was in terms of walking us through as to the, the benefit. And, and we need to have that conversation, in my view, nationally. In fact, during the pandemic with having the, the CERB was pretty much a basic income pilot we ran. And one right. of the things that mm -hmm. I've been asking at the federal level that over the two, almost two and a half years or so that we did this, we must have created, must have gathered some data, some metric by which we can see how did people live. We, were they able to have secure housing? Were they able to feed themselves? Were we able those, to see still their dentist or get their eyes checked? Those, those kind of information could be really helpful for us to have a more wholesome conversation, not only just at the provincial level, but nationally. I think we're all sharing the same values and principles here. We don't want anyone left behind. We need to put more money into programs like ODSP, like special education and assistance for autism, uh, children, aut autistic children as well, autism programs. But to that, we need Ted's ideas on, on growing our economy, being more productive, growing our revenue base here in the province, uh, creating jobs. As we've all heard, Premier Ford's government wants to go back to basics in education. Our sponsor, the Ontario English Catholic Teachers Association, knows that every child needs more, and they're calling on all Ontarians to join their campaign to achieve just that at nomore.ca. Surely we can all agree that every child is unique and deserves the resources and supports they need to thrive. Whether it's smaller class sizes, more one-on-one -on -one time with their teachers, extra help with reading and math, or more mental health supports. No one wants their kid to get lost in a crowd, and every student deserves to learn in a school that is safe and modern. For OECTA, that means real government investment to address the teacher shortage so that every student has a qualified teacher in their classroom. This and more student supports in schools mean better and safer schools for everybody. Ontario English Catholic teachers want to go beyond the basics. They want Premier Ford's government to invest in schools and support every student. Because when we invest in students, we invest in the future. Visit nomore.ca and sign up for the campaign today. That's K-N-O-W-M-O-R-E dot C-A. Well, can I ask you a precise question about that? Sure. So... I mean, actually, this is a pretty bleak picture if you look at it. Um, productivity is projected to be in Ontario, in Canada, in the Western world, flat for as far as the eye can see. And in Ontario, we the only growth we see in our GDP is population-related growth. There's no per capita Through growth. Through immigration as well. Yeah. yeah. No per capita growth in our GDP. That means our standard of living is at best static and perhaps falling mm -hmm. behind. And our capacity to afford all these other things we liberals like to think about is impossible, mm -hmm. right? What's a plan for growing Ontario's economy? What, what's, what, what do we need to, what can liberals bring to that story? 
Yeah, we need to grow our economy. That's the bottom line. We need to attract investment. Um, we need to prepare our young people for the jobs and skills of tomorrow. I know I work with our high schools and our colleges to ensure that there, our young people receive the training in Mississauga for the jobs that we have available. And I think training is very important. I need. I think we need to focus on skilled training as well. Um, I think those are, are very well-paid, highly skilled, well-paying jobs in the, in the trades. And it's something we don't focus on as well. The other thing I'll say about Canadians generally is that we tend to be a little risk averse, uh, unlike our American counterparts. And, you know, yes, we've got seed money at my city for Idea Mississauga, which is an incubator and an accelerator, but the access to angel money, angel funding, venture capital money uh, isn't as readily available here or at the same rates as it is in the United States. And so I think there's some of that that we need to attract more uh, investment, investment capital uh, so that our young entrepreneurs um, can can commercialize their ideas. Nate, but, how does Ontario break out of that low growth, no growth future? It's not easy to do because of where we're at, but there are a number of big issues that need to be addressed if we're going to do it. Housing, for example, we talk about it a lot as a fairness challenge. It is an economic productivity challenge. You have a whole cohort of young people who are leaving their home communities and leaving our province ultimately. Many are going to Alberta because they cannot afford to live and work here. Right. And that's going to worsen the productivity challenge. You look at climate change and we got to protect the planet for our kids. Of course we do. That's, that's a motivating force. But it, any serious person who's looking at the global transition, it's happening with or without us. And this is about attracting investment and creating jobs. And if we aren't a player in that in a serious way, if we don't, and and Ted's right when he looks at sustainable energy and saying, you know, we've got a, a fairly clean grid today, but Doug Ford is not making it any better. It's actually getting worse. And how are we going to make sure that we maintain a level of competitiveness in that global transition and ensure that we are creating jobs here in Ontario? And there is an absolutely an underinvestment in R&D by businesses. But I would say too, from a, the government's perspective, where, where can the government play a role? We shouldn't be in the business of subsidizing businesses. We shouldn't be in that business of corporate welfare. What is the answer? Well, the answer is, integrated infrastructure where if businesses are coming and making investments in particular communities, but that investment hinges upon making sure that there's access to a bridge or access to a road or access to broadband, then that's the role that government plays in that broader infrastructure piece. And you I think- You're suggesting you're against the Volkswagen investment? Not against Stalactus? it. Not against it. I mean, that was designed in such a way that the subsidy is delivered for the purposes of delivering on where there is actual production. You know, I look, I've gone back and forth with experts who say, does the math add up? I'm not sure. I've gone back and forth with other experts, though, who say it does because of it's not just about that one project. It's about all of the surrounding benefits to the, to the region and to the auto sector and the supply chain. So you do have to look at, at it holistically. And obviously, there was a major investment there to secure an anchor for that supply chain. But uh, you do have to be strategic in it, but you, not everything can be cast as an investment. I think this is where we sometimes get into trouble, certainly as liberals. Kevin Page will tell you, some things are investments with a return. Not everything is an investment, but politicians describe everything as an investment. Mm -hmm. right. David, Ontario's biggest natural resource is its human resource. So we got to invest in our people. Um, we need to unleash the potential of people. I think one of the biggest challenges, and, and, and Bonnie's right about Skills we training. are not risk takers. We become adver averse to taking risk. You've got highly skilled people coming into this province, best of the best from the world, and we deploy them to low skilled jobs. And we're okay with that. We're really comfortable with that. Talk about productivity loss there, as opposed to getting them economically integrated not in 10 or 15 years, but in two to three years, as quickly as possible, we're undermining ourselves. Look what are we doing with our young people? We're indebting them so much. They're doing all the right things. They're going to university, they're going to college, but they're coming up with such large student loans that it takes them a decade before they can really start their life in a meaningful fashion. Mm. That's why I want to bring free tuition back for modest income, $90,000 or less. Let's get them educated and come out of college university with little to no debt so that they can start reinvesting back in our economy. We have to focus on our people. Let, let them live their lives and let them grow the way they want to grow by making sure that they've got the, the, 
the resources available to them to do so. That's that's our greatest asset, and we're really significantly undermining it. I, I think there's some specific things that we can do to make the innovation and commercialization in our economy uh, stronger. Uh, one is we can help people file their uh, initial patents. Uh, strong patent applications require some money. We need to encourage people to make money from their IP here in Canada so it doesn't get bought up and taken away. Governments can, through their procurement, uh, procure innovative things in in. Uh, in Ontario, uh, housing, for example, there's there's prefab housing, 3D printed housing, uh, uh, passive housing, all sorts of different ideas. Governments can encourage that by through its procurement. We can encourage exports because if you export, you have to compete with other uh, companies in other parts of the world. You have to innovate and you have to invest uh, and increase your own productivity. We could take down interprovincial. <laughs> barriers to trade to increase uh, competition. We could find unicorns. <laughs> we could find... <laughs> I was gonna, I was, I well, we've got promise a few times <laughs> before. <laughs> we, if you think about unicorns from the, from the as uh, defined in the investment world as billion dollar companies, yeah, we yeah. need to help Ontario companies grow to that size. Uh, where where you can you have all sorts of advantages when you're competing in the world. Well, let me yeah. put a very practical case to you though. Do you think it is possible that we will never develop the Ring of Fire? It is possible if we realize, uh, and we don't know that information yet, uh, that the deposits are of insufficient quality. Because what I've- well, That's not what, what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the resistance to the impediments to developing, to even building a road there. Mm -hmm. Like, it's are we actually going to let that happen? If we don't, get uh, the indigenous communities who are around the Ring of Fire, mm. if they do not, uh, by their own uh, free prior informed consent, agree to be partners mm -hmm. uh, with uh, mining companies in uh, outside of that area, then it won't happen. I agree. And it shouldn't happen. If, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't try as hard as we, we can to earn we do the hard uh, work. that partnership. And and you know it's not like there's somebody there who says absolutely forever and ever and ever uh, you will never build a road up to Ring of Fire. They they say what they'll say is like we don't trust we don't mm. trust you because of what happened in the past. Yeah. So we have a long road to go, <laughs> a figurative road to go in rebuilding that trust. Uh, indigenous communities have to have their own capability to evaluate for themselves how much of a benefit they will receive and what resources they need to really benefit uh, from to get the high-paying, value-added jobs out of any kind of uh, mining project. And then they have to decide for themselves whether they want to participate. And if they do, then it will be the pr project will proceed. Bonnie, I, I 10 think... years ago, we promised the people of Northern Ontario as a party that we would build a road to the Ring of Fire. Yeah. And we used to have the Northlander operating as well. Mm -hmm. It's a long way to go. And I think this province and this country has a lot of work to do with respect to our relationship with Indigenous people uh, and truth and reconciliation generally. And they do have to be made to feel that they're equal partners, that they do have governance in this, that they do have ownership in it, and that they will we will sh fairly share proceeds of any of the development of that land. Um, certainly, it's a huge opportunity for us, but it must be developed fairly. And Indigenous communities must feel that ownership and that benefit from it as well, uh, fairly. Mm. No, no one said that reconciliation was going to be easy, right? So we got to do the meaningful work. We got to do the hard work to right. the trust. And I think, I think the, 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 the track that just Ted just laid out is, is bang on in, in that regard. So I, I think putting timelines or making threats like Doug Ford did that he's going to get on a bulldozer himself to build that road does not help. Uh, we need to build that trust because there is there's generations of mistrust there that has to be undermined before mm -hmm. we can um, responsibly extract that. So I think I think. But the world has other timelines for those minerals. Well, but we we have our past to deal with as well. Right? I mean, we, we have to be mindful of that. There, there is an urgency, no question, when you look at the need for critical minerals in the transition, and there's no question a real economic opportunity. How do you realize that economic, economic opportunity as quickly as possible? Y you don't jump on the bulldozer first. That actually sets us back. Right. And so there's, there's no way of, of 
seen any development. I, I was just texting with a chief from Ingamine yesterday, and one, there's not just a lack of trust as between that community and the government. There's a lack of trust between that community and mining operations because of historical polluting of, of lakes. And at the same time, they're dealing with a completely separate crisis of mental health and and drug overdoses and deaths in their very small community that there's not going to be any bandwidth to even consider tough conversations around economic development if we don't first really help them where they're at and listen to them and deliver for their needs. And so, you know, yes, the world has a timeline. There's a, this huge opportunity. We have to think, how can we most effectively advance this opportunity in partnership? And it y- you can't put things all at once to say, we're going to go off and do it because you, you end up not doing it at all in that case. Right. Okay. Hey. Um, we're running uh, low on time, and I'm going to give you guys a, your closing statement. But I do want to hear you talk about my hobby horse for a second. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to impose my will on this debate, which Elton is John? pardon Elton John. Elton John. <laughs> music, there's music. no debating Elton John. We can talk about Elton John, but there's no debating it. Um, what I wanted to talk about was long-term care. Mm. So the truth of the matter is, is that as we sit here. Those homes are in no better shape than they were when they were ve- revealed at the beginning of COVID to be inadequate, understaffed, under supervised, under resourced, and negligent. And there seemed an overwhelming will in the province for a period of time that this was something that had to get corrected. And now that feels like 100 years ago. I don't hear anybody talk about that anymore. I don't sense that Fords aren't under any pressure on that issue anymore. And so all those people have just gone back to living in those conditions and all those workers have just gone back to working in those conditions. Do you have any thoughts about that? I do. So I think that if we had implemented the recommendations from the SARS report, we'd have been much further ahead. Um, And we would have, far more of our seniors would have survived during the COVID crisis when we saw inadequate conditions and a lack of supervision. And the excuse given was, well, we were under lockdown, so we didn't think we could go in. And many of our seniors had been betrayed and neglected. And I won't say the word abused, but there's a potential of that as well. Um, I think that also, our public uh, seniors homes, LTCs, fared much better. We have different standards. I know in the region of Peel, we we don't have those ward rooms with four in a room that are divided by a curtain. And the outcomes were much stronger. We saw fewer deaths um, and, uh, you know, I, I, just much better circumstances. And we never did apply the rule that the PSWs that work in those facilities keep only one job and they'd be and they'd be employed full time not have a you know a, a number of part time jobs just to pay their bills at different homes and they were uh, transmitting the disease every time they went to visit patients um, in a different home so long term care is something we need to come to, to to terms with there are many systems and many learning opportunities from abroad even in european uh, european conditions are much different and how we house the very people in their senior years who gave birth to us and raised us. Now, we all know I have an 87-year-old mother named Veronica. Uh, She's a force of nature like Hazel. She likes to tell me every day what I do wrong and right, and mostly it's wrong. But she did say to me, you have to commit to me that if you win this thing, you will, or any one of us, I'll get you to commit to, you will put more money uh, aside for seniors who want to age in place and age at home and provide those supports through PSWs and, and and, you know, uh, more medical supports. Even remember, I remember when my grandfather was alive, he used to have a visit from the family doctor. Can you imagine a family doctor stopping in at a senior in their home today? But that's the way it was. And that wasn't that long ago, 20, 25 years ago. Um, and we need to pay fair wages to those PSWs who are caring for the very people uh, that we love in their senior years. Um, and, you know, my children are going to be making some decisions about where to put me in my senior years. So be very nice to them. But we certainly, we have to change not only the way the facilities are, are built um, and the, the conditions, and they vary. There doesn't seem to be a universal standard across the province, David. I've been in some homes that are impeccable, and the, and the residents love the food and love their caregivers, and others that seem entirely inadequate. So there needs to be standards applied. There needs to be that supervision. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of changes that need to be made. But if we had started by implementing 
implementing what we learned out of the SARS report and applied them, we would have uh, we had better outcomes. Mm. I, th- I think this issue is going to grow for another 15 or 20 years uh, because of demographics. And th- there have been estimates on how much it will all cost if we continue along the, the current path, which is to rely more on for-profit institutional long-term right. care, something like 4% of GDP by, by 2040. So very expensive. Uh, but there's a solution. There's an alternative. And you can look around the world. Denmark is one of the yes, countries that people exactly. look at where uh, they stopped building institutional long-term care and relied on home okay. and community care. Uh, it's less expensive. People are happier. And that's something. That's a path that we should be going down that the current government is not going down. The cost pressures are going are gonna to build up. Uh, And the cost pressures, it's not just going to be money, it's going to be a decrease in quality. Uh, And and those things, it's going to come back, this issue, uh, unless we address it. And that's something that the next government, a liberal government, uh, should really uh, take the bull by its horns and and, and deal with. Because it's something that if we don't deal with it now, it's just going to be more expensive to deal with in the coming two decades. The only Mm. caveat, Ted, is that there is a rise of dementia and Alzheimer's. And there is a certain fragment of our population that will need institutional care. Care. There will it, always be always for, be yeah. Yeah. for yeah. some institutional yeah, yeah. care, and like yeah. like my yeah. my my eighty eight year old dad always tells me, there's no better place than home. I like home. Um, he's he's adamant that this is where he's gonna die. Like he does not. He said, get me get me care if I need it for assisted living, but home is where I want to because I know my home. So I think I think all my friends are right. We 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 would need uh, a, a spectrum of solutions in this in this regards. If uh, we need to make sure that. My dad, Bonnie's my mom. mom, are able to live at home as long as they can and they get the support they need because I think this is where they're most independent and most comfortable. But there may be a situation will come or some for some, they, it may not be an option where they have to be in a long-term care facility. And I visit a lot of them in my community in, in, in Ottawa and some are great. They feel like home. Some look like you're visiting a hospital. Right. And we got to make sure that there's Spectrum. better standards in place, better care in place, Things again like food and one-on-one time, the kind of things that human need and deserve are there, especially in a humane society like ours. The food's disgusting. Not that's everywhere. That's what I've been told. No, but not public, everywhere. But the private that's, yeah. ones, they don't, pay, they don't spend yeah. any money on it. Well, so I, I think you're right to say the political pressure has waned. That isn't to say, though, that people won't remember when we revisit the conversation, the military went in and, and had had to be called in because of the state of some of the long-term, long-term care facilities. And these challenges have existed for many years predating the pandemic, although we all paid attention during the pandemic in a more serious way. The answer on the long-term care front is implementing the national standards and making sure that we do have better ratios, we do have more investments, and we prioritize nonprofit care and not for-profit care. There is, though, great political pressure when it comes to home and community care because baby boomers do not want to go to these long-term care institutions. They want to age in place. They want to age with dignity. And, you know, Ted mentions Denmark. When I had Dr. Samir Sinha on my podcast, the geriatrician, he mentioned Denmark. And I was like, okay, people are mentioning Denmark. What's the magic to Denmark? And when I got the Library of Parliament to do research, it came back they spend two-thirds of every dollar on home and community care. We spend two-thirds of every dollar on long-term care and institutional care. And so the answer is to shift our spending over time towards home and community care. Now, that is going to depend a great deal on labor, and it's going to depend a great deal on supporting caregivers. And I'll close just with a personal story because you know I don't. my parents are not – needing to be in a long-term care facility and they're not needing home care right now. But my grandmother is 95. My mom renovated her basement, turned it into a one-bedroom apartment, brought my grandma in from Grimsby five years ago. And it was the right decision. But my mom is the sole caregiver and it's tough. And what we need in this province is we need caregivers who are saving us all money and providing the best possible care for their loved ones, they need to be able to go to a single window and say, look, I don't need round-the-clock care. I'm able to deliver most of it, but I do need a PSW to come in once a week. I do need Mm -hmm. someone to cook meals every once in a while. And we do not have that support for caregivers, Mm -hmm. and it has consequences for our loved ones in the end. You know, these are trained professionals, PSWs. 
and they're not even paid a fair wage. Yeah. And I think it's something, or they don't have job security either. Mm-hmm. And that's something I think as liberals, we need to look at more closely. I think it's the failure of flexibility in the system that really gets people. Right, and whether it's uh, art support for artists, artistic children, mm-hmm. uh, it's like the programs are so rigid that you, you you can't quibble with it. Same thing with with home care for for our grandparents or our parents. This is where I was saying earlier that we we need to be a little bit more nimble as how we implement mm-hmm. solutions. Um, it it cannot be bureaucratic and rigid. I see you smiling, smirking at me right now, but <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> but I think I think that's that is the the level of sophistication we need to bring, and it varies from province to province, and and from families to families. And government, if they put their mind to it, can do so, and probably more efficient and have better outcomes. Can I give mm-hmm. one example before we close this? Or are we out of time? I'm just really proud of the program we have in Peel Region. We adopted it from the UK, and it's called the Butterfly Model. And it's sensory-based care for people with Alzheimer's or dementia. Yeah. And they are you know, live animals, dogs. Uh, there are baby uh, dolls that look like babies, and people, women walk around with little dolls. And we have, you know, uh, bridal, not, uh, baby showers and uh, feeding sessions. And um, the hallways are painted in specific colors because nice. they can identify the color of their home. And their door frame has a picture of the door back at their home so they can identify it. it's their space. And just one more quick example. There was one man who was completely non-communicative whatsoever. It didn't speak, didn't react in any way. And they did some uh, investigation on his preferences um, as an adult, and they found he loved music. And his favorite wasn't Elton John. It was ABBA. They piped in ABBA music into his ears one day, and he started singing. And I saw that, and it, I was just elated, and I was so thankful that a place like this existed. I thought, should it ever come to this? The Americans did that to the Iraqis. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a good program. Here, David. I just visited one in, in, in the Glebe in Ottawa in yeah, my writing. It's and going throughout the province yeah. now. I really love them, and they bake mm-hmm. bread, so they get that sensory. Because mm-hmm. the people with dementia forget to eat. They don't have that impulse yeah. that they have to eat, and so they make food and... Uh, there's a cloak room where the men go in and put their hat and tie their tie. They think they're going to work. It's just the most incredible place. Sounds interesting, and I hope I never see it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think it is time to wrap up. I think it's time for our closing statements, and I want you to take, you know, three minutes, a little bit of time, spell it out, give your pitch to people. I just will start with one preamble, which is that Keith Davy. One of the great lions of the Liberal Party's history the had a maker. maxim that said, You win election campaigns by playing to your strengths. You win leadership campaigns by addressing your weaknesses. So, with that in mind, cool. <laughs> <laughs> with that in mind, yes, sir, why don't we start with you? Well, um, first of all, thank you for hosting us. I think this was a this was a great conversation. So sincerely appreciate it. Um, you know, our party our party is going through a moment right now, and uh, it's a moment where the party has to elect the right leader, who's going to help build our our party. Um, and Ontarians are looking at the Ontario Liberal Party to to do that hard work in terms of finding a leader that is the most trustworthy. As we were talking earlier, people are struggling. People have real needs across this this province. And for me to come into the race, I came with a mission, which is to defeat Doug Ford in 2026. And for that, number one, we have to transform our party. We have to make sure that our party is strong in every single region, in every single riding, that liberals see a purpose for being liberals and want to participate and engage like we used to in the, in the past. Number two, as a leader, I'm going to be focused and disciplined in championing practical liberal solutions that will make people's lives easier to live. Focusing on healthcare, focusing on education, focusing on affordability housing, the kind of things that people really need help with. Because that's how we will be able to earn their trust and they will be able to look at us again as as a government. Lastly, the kind of leader matters. We need a leader who is trustworthy. We need a leader who can relate to people. We need a leader who's done the hard work to build their own own lives and have been able to challenge the status quo. You know, I come from a very humble background. We were immigrant family. As I was telling you earlier, we ran a small motel. I used to sleep on the floor in in our small two-bedroom apartment in a family of of five. But our whole family pulled together and we worked hard to build our, our lives. 
And that's the story of Ontario. And we need a leader who under understand that because the promise of Ontario has broken by Doug Ford. Our public health care system is not there. Our public education system is not there for people. And I'll be the, the person who will restore that promise for all Ontarians. All right. Thank you, Yasser. Thank, Thank you. you. Nate. So I think there are two questions that liberal members are going to answer in this leadership race. And the first question is about the direction of the party. And I have emphasized values in the course of this race. Competence, a strong economic agenda, seriousness that we don't see at Queen's Park, fairness and compassion for those in need, and above all things, the most important value if we are going to rebuild trust in the possibility of politics and in our party is integrity. And we have to carry ourselves with those values. We can't just be the not Doug Ford party, and, and Doug Ford lacks those values for sure, but we have to embody those values. It's also about serious ideas, and we spent most of the time today talking about serious ideas to address people's challenges in every corner of this province. And they are more acutely felt in different places, but there are common challenges that we all face. There's no question about it. And it really has to be, I think, overridingly a focus on housing, a focus on healthcare and defending a strong public health care system, defending our public education system, investing in and out of the classroom for our kids, and then about strong climate action that is about creating jobs and lowering energy bills and creating a healthier society today as much as it is about protecting the planet for our kids. It's also about the hard work of rebuilding relationships and rebuilding an active presence absolutely everywhere. And the second question is, who's best place to beat Doug Ford? And my argument throughout this leadership race is the answer to both of those questions is the same. If we are going to beat Doug Ford, we have to be the serious, credible party on the big picture challenges in people's lives, especially on housing. We have to have credibility on housing. We have to have credibility and trust on the Greenbelt scandal and the Greenbelt. We have to be credible and trusted that we are going to be, not just be seen to be, but to be, the serious, credible, progressive alternative, not a right-of-center alternative, a progressive alternative to Doug Ford. Because if we poll at 24% and the NDP polls at 24%, Doug Ford wins every single election. That's the math in Ontario. We need to be seen to be the alternative in the next election. And, you know, you talk about weaknesses. I, I went into this and there was a perception... I certainly felt that I was only going to succeed if I could build a team in every corner of the province, not just in Toronto. And I spent months and months and months on the road before I even made a decision because I didn't have that team yet. If, we, if and when we win this, it's going to be because of rural and northern Ontario because we have such strong teams well outside of the GTA. Another one of my weaknesses perceived, I think, more than actual, but is this idea that I'm more of a maverick than a leader. And I can tell you, you know, I've got more than 20 caucus colleagues who I've worked with who would disagree with that and are supporting me in this race. But, but more than that, that idea of rebuilding trust depends upon strong local representation and integrity. And I not only have a track record of working across party lines to be effective in getting things done, shaping the government's agenda, I also have a track record of, yeah, not always agreeing all the time, pushing the government to be the best version of itself. That's the kind of politics that we need in every single corner of this province. I don't want people to join my team and agree with every single thing that I want to do. I want them to push me on behalf of their communities in every single corner of this province, push me to be the best leader that I can be and push our party to be the best party that it can be. And that is how we are going to rebuild trust. So they are perceived weaknesses. I think they're actual strengths when we are rebuilding our party to rebuild our province. Thanks, Nate. Bonnie. Hmm. Thank you. I think our adversary is Doug Ford. He's broken the trust with the people, and they've shown to be there in it for the wrong reasons, to enrich their rich friends. They don't share our values as liberals. And my closing, I'd like to say that every liberal matters. We have a big tent. We take people from all spectrum of liberalism, and we need all of your ideas to win. And we are going to win. And I don't mean in 2030 or 2034, but we are going to win in, in uh, 2026. There are liberals who were disillusioned and stayed home. There were liberals who were pragmatic and maybe voted for another party to stop Doug Ford. We need them all, and we need them to come back, and we need to work together. We have an incredible team here, and we need everyone on the ground as well, and that's why every liberal matters. Now, we all 
we are very fortunate as liberals that we have such high caliber individuals who have put their names forward. They each bring a different level of expertise to the table and could easily be the leader. But the choice is up to the membership. It's not like that other party where one woman stepped up and they said, OK, Merritt, it's, it's over to you. You're the only one who wants it. We got people fighting for this. We had five great candidates and now we have four. And I'm very grateful to Adil Shamji for his support in boosting my campaign. And we certainly pledge to adopt a lot of his ideas. And I, I will say that we all bring different expertise. Mine is that I bring a lot of experience. I've been in this a long time. I've been an elected official for 15 years, but before that I had a 20-year business career. I've been a senior executive of a lot of companies. I have an MBA and a director's degree. Um, and I went, to, I took the early retirement package and from federal politics and became a counselor and the mayor of the city of Mississauga, where the people have confidence in me and my leadership ability. They voted me with increased majorities each time. This time, 78% of the vote. And I'm pretty darn, darn proud of that. Um, but I'm also very practical. As a mayor, we tend to be. Uh, we know that we're very fiscally responsible. Uh, my priorities are growing the economy and creating jobs, as I mentioned. Um, but uh, I know that my revenue is not is finite. And I have to apply the revenue we earn to the greatest priorities. And I I think we all agree that affordability is one of the greatest priorities, bringing back more affordable housing. And I will say that I'm the, really the only one in this room that has actually built housing and approved housing. And I'm very proud of my record, taking Mississauga from a sleepy suburb into a dynamic urban powerhouse uh, that is built on diversity and inclusivity today, where we are adopting heights and densities and walking away from exclusive zoning and building on the waterfront on reclaimed land and rebuilding public transit and bringing jobs to our city. And I'm very proud of that record. But this party has to stand up to Doug Ford. And there's, and I think I'm the one who rankles him. I've, I'm the one who has gone toe to toe with him publicly and in the media. And I think that's a very important skill set. We need a party that will bring us back to something we all agree on, universal single-tier medicine, move away from private medicine, build more affordable housing, put a focus on rebuilding and, and our education system, which was to be a model around the world when Dalton McGuinty was our premier, um, and reduce classroom sizes, etc., and focus on climate change. We have people like Ted sitting right here, who's an expert on this, and we need his expertise. We need everyone's expertise to come to the table. And yes, I will say unequivocally, we need to protect our agricultural belt. We need to protect our farmland. And I'm very proud of my council that stepped up and opposed the building of the 413 because it was going to cut across 52 hectares of sensitive land and agricultural land. And we will always stand up and do the right thing. And so I'm very grateful. I know that we're going to build a war chest. I know that we are going to speak to issues that matter to people right across this province, not only in the large urban settings, the small towns, the rural communities, the northern communities, the francophone um, communities as well. We will recruit the best candidates. Let's get them going as soon as possible. Let's get them nominated and on the road quickly, and we will win. And we will win in 2026. This go government is, is vulnerable, and we need someone who can stand up to him, who has a track record of standing up to him and raising a lot of money so that we can win. Thank you, David. Thank you, Bonnie. <clears throat> Ted. Uh, so back to your point, David, about addressing weaknesses. Um, people have said, Ted, you're too nice. And uh, yeah, and I use that to advantage. I use that to win elections. <laughs> um, what I am is somebody who <laughs> unifies people across the political spectrum. It's, it's what I did in 2011 when I first got elected. Um, but there are things, you know, we've been talking today about all the problems that we face and the, the limitations of how we're going to pay for the possible solutions. Uh, Doug Ford just tried to give $8 billion of public value away to a small number of friends and donors. And you have to think about what that means to people, the 50% of people in Ontario who are struggling, they're living paycheck to paycheck, and how demoralizing it is that the government doesn't have their back. Um, we need to care a lot. We need to give a damn about the people who are struggling. We need to be the, the party that is trusted to care about that. 
we also need to reach out to um, everybody everywhere in the province. And you know, I I take advantage of my the fact that I have farms in my writing to talk about abattoirs to to farmers in other parts of the province. It's a way mm. of opening the conversation. But um, we need to to really reach across the spectrum. I you know I have this background in. Uh, working in different areas, and it's not a, so much about providing expertise. Uh, it is that helps, but if you, I have a background in science and business and environment and politics, and I, I speak Chinese. I and I've uh, speak French. Lived in France for a while, but the the, uh, the way you use those things in politics is to make a connection with people. Um, and what I offer is not. Uh, uh, the ability to take a shot at Doug Ford and entertain people. It's to unify the opposition to the conservative uh, vision, to appeal to people from different parties. That's how I was able to mm-hmm. increase the liberal vote in 2011 mm-hmm. when the federal liberals had their worst ever uh, electoral disaster. Uh, I know not only won, but I increased the liberal vote. And I want to do that across the province. I think that we have faced so many hard problems that we've talked about today. Uh, Affordability, housing, healthcare capacity, mental health and addictions, disruption in our schools, uh, shortage of skilled labor, the climate crisis, and the the large debt that our kids that are inheriting. Um, It's really, really tough. And we need everybody rowing in the same direction. We really need to gather... Uh, a large, uh, largest possible consensus. And to do that, we have to fight polarization in our politics, in our society. And I truly believe that the Liberal Party is the party to do that, and I'm the leader for that Liberal Party. Awesome. Thank you, Ted. Uh, listen, you know, I've seen a lot of these races. This party is extraordinarily lucky to have the four of you running uh, for this job. Four super talented, super good People, I'm really, I'm really happy you're all in public life, and I'm really happy you're all seeking <clears throat> this position. Um, and uh, really do wish you all the best of luck. I'd like to thank our presenting sponsor, Tell Us, our sponsor, CN Rail, OECTA, the Ontario English Catholic Teachers Association, and the first sponsor this podcast ever had, Oria, the Ontario Real Estate Association. Thank all of you for your support of this special hurly burly. Debate broadcast, uh, liberals, I think you have a lot to think about after this, uh, but you've got four tremendous choices. And I'm grateful to all of you for having graced our little podcast with your presence this afternoon. So thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. We didn't curse, David. David. Nobody cursed. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Nobody cursed, it's too bad. We didn't do any rapid fire. Those were always fun. <laughs> Well, listen, we can go for another half an hour with some rapid-fire questions if you want. (laughs) Boxers, briefs, dark chocolate, light chocolate, milk chocolate. (laughs) What books are you reading? What are you reading, Mr. Gale? What Netflix show are you watching tonight? Awesome. Thank you for doing this. Thank you. It's great. (laughs) Thank you.